Hey, sales girls, Macy McNeely here, and I'm excited to add a video to our $20 million series. If you're new here, we create world-class sales girls, and we have a goal to have a $20 million business. And I'm so excited about this goal, mostly because of who we have to become in order to reach that goal. And in the very first video of this series, I shared the Q4 2023 meeting that I shared with our team. It was really like a message to help people feel inspired to think differently, to feel differently, and to act differently, to break through the plateau that we've been experiencing. So definitely, if you, ha if you haven't watched that video, stop, go to the description below, click that video, watch it, and then come back to this one. And definitely subscribe because we'll be adding to this series uh, for as long as it takes to hit that $20 million goal. So I cannot wait to take you along on this journey. Now, in that first video, I talked about how we were going to have to experience the river of misery. Uh, we had been in a plateau. We've been in business for five years. The time that I'm recording this is January the 4th of 2024. And of those five years, about three of them, we've been at that 1.2 to $1.5 million range. And um, it's been a very interesting experience because we've done so many things to try to improve the, the business and to grow the revenue. We've added more offers, more team members, more layers and levels to the offers, we have spent more in ads than ever before. We've tried new strategies and it just always seems to be the same. And what I now know is that changing the actions isn't enough. What is really required is who you are that helps determine what those actions are. And what I mean by who you are, it's really what you're thinking and what you're feeling. And um, that has been the biggest game changer for us. And, and I explained that in the video, in, in video one, the first one of the series of really changing your thoughts and your feelings so that the actions reflect who you are becoming. And that process of doing something different is the river of misery. So you're really experiencing a totally different identity, right? So this is for us, it was 1.5 million. You could put a revenue number here. You could put um, a weight goal here. Honestly, you could put anything like the number of friends that you have, but this is kind of your current result and your new identity holds the keys to a different result. And the reason it can be so hard to break into this is because the brain loves homeostasis. The brain loves to think the same things over and over and over again. The brain loves to know what to expect. It loves predictability. In fact, the brain would prefer an unfavorable condition if it meant that it knew what to expect versus the possibility of a much more favorable condition, but having unpredictable circumstances. So this process of going from here to here, it really hurts in a sense. And what I mean by that is it causes discomfort. Now that meeting leading into Q4, I believe was the very thing that helped us break through this plateau. So in Q4 alone of 2023, we did $1,040,000, almost what we have done an entire year in the last three years, we did in a quarter. And 2023 final revenue was $2,500,000. And so the growth was not only you know, a little growth, but it was double. It was two X what we've almost always done. And I believe with all my heart, it was from this process of really moving in this direction. Now we definitely are still in it, right? I don't know if we'll ever not be in the river of misery because that means we're always evolving. Um, but as someone who has really gone in head first, gone in hard, gone in fast. I feel like I can describe to you what the river of misery feels like. If you were kind of deciding, do I want to go all in here? Do I want to really force myself to go in and go hard and dive deep in order to get a different result? I want to really describe just personally what I experienced um, through this process. And I think it will help you see that, you know, while it is uncomfortable, it's also uncomfortable to stay right here. And it is so incredibly worth it. So I want to tell you what it feels like and what it looks like. So the two biggest emotions, in my opinion, that I felt going through the river of misery was self-doubt. And the second one was fear. 
And if you think about self-doubt, it makes so much sense because, you know, this is your brain. Your brain is like, hey, we're good. Like I'm going back to homeostasis right here. Hey, we're good. Like everything is good enough, right? There's no need to push yourself. There's no need to do things differently. Like stay right here. And as you move into this new identity, this brain is saying, no, 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 you can't do it. This is where we're comfortable. Why would you go here? And I think what's really important here is to learn how to reframe self-doubt because it's inevitable, really. And I notice a lot of my clients, they'll call it imposter syndrome. And maybe that's what it is where you feel like an imposter, but really you're doubting what you're actually capable of doing. And you can call it that. You can also call it just self-doubt. And what I like to label self-doubt as is actually my compass. When I'm feeling self-doubt, I know I am moving into a different identity. I know that, that I am in the process of going in a direction that isn't where I am most comfortable. And that is how I know I'm actually on the right path. And the same thing is with fear. Like it really is an ally. It is a friend. And what I now know is that the level of fear that is felt is directly correlated to how important it is to move forward. And I was reading something about the um, the show that was called Inside the Actors Studio. And basically the host would bring actors on the show and interview them to ask them about the roles that they played in specific movies. And I thought it was really interesting to hear how actors would be asked, hey, how did you decide or how did you know what role you wanted to choose? If you have all these options, what made you choose this one? And the great actors would, would, would respond with, you know, I, I hadn't experienced it before. I was kind of scared to do that role. Why on earth would I choose a role that I've already done? That doesn't stretch me. I want to go in uncharted territory. I want to experience something I've never experienced before. And it made me think about these two identities, right? They're, they're almost like roles. And it's like, if you experience this role for the rest of your life, like there's no fun. You stay exactly the same. There's no evolvement. When you choose a role or an identity that you're unsure about, that's how you know that you will evolve and get better. And that that's what a professional actor does. And this role, choosing this one, is what prepares them for the future roles. You know, it makes me think about, um, you know, people that win the lottery, they're so likely to blow all the money. Why is that? Why is it that when someone wins money, they're less likely to keep it than someone that earns it? Because someone that earns it had to go through this. And when you go through this, you become a person that is able to value money and know like the work that it has taken to get it. And so therefore you treat it with so much more respect versus someone who just gets it for no reason. They just win it by luck. They haven't become a person that can hold on to it. And so this journey is while painful, beautiful and critical and really a non-negotiable. You cannot, uh, you know, experience success without going through this. I want to talk to you about what the river of misery kind of looks like, because um, it has been such a fascinating experience of really forcing my brain to take action differently from almost from this place, from this identity versus from this identity. If you have a piece of paper in your hand watching this, um, or if you're driving, or if you're just thinking, you can think about this too. I want to give you 10 seconds to draw a house. Okay. Ready? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right. How did you draw your house? I can almost guarantee that it looks something like this. If you're listening on audio, you have a square with a triangle on top, a door and two windows. Is that what your house looks like? Every time I do this with people, they hold up their house and it looks exactly the same. Now, when did you learn how to draw a house like this? Probably when you were about five years old. 
and you haven't thought about it again since. You continuously draw the house the same exact way. Now, I want you to draw a castle. I know for me, when I sit here and I and I need to draw a castle, like the best way I can describe how I feel is like resistant. I feel a block. I feel like my brain can't compute with my hand on how to draw a castle. It feels really uncomfortable. And that's exactly what the river of misery feels like when you are doing actions as a different person. There's almost this block that happens because you're doing actions differently. And it's not even like you're doing more action. Sometimes you're doing less action. One thing that's been fascinating for me on this journey is that it's actually required less work. It's required things to be easier. It's required for things to be simpler. And I feel like I'm now a recovering hard aholic. It's almost like subconsciously, this $1.5 million Macy right here, I've subconsciously think, been thinking like, I have to earn it the hard way. I have to make it harder on myself so that it I feel like worthy of earning it. And in this last quarter, what I have done is really try to ask myself, how can this be more simple? How can I be a simple holic, right? Like how can I focus on being a person that takes simple actions that gets big results and doing things differently, even if it is as simple as drawing a house differently is really difficult. It feels like a lot of resistance. I almost feel like I'm kind of stiff arming um, all these new and different ways of doing something because I'm just not used to it. And if you can approach this river of misery and just know you're going to be required to do things differently and you're going to hit a lot of bumps in the road. Now, what I think most people do is they feel these bumps and I think they instantly go to someone for an answer. I know I've hosted many, many communities, online entrepreneurial communities. And what I have found and what I like, I see it now in such a bigger picture. I found that the people that are the most active in the community, they're doing the least amount of work. And what I, what I say work, I mean like needle moving work. They're taking the least amount of action in the world and taking the most amount of action in the community. And it's no one's fault because we've been trained to do this, right? It's like, I want you to imagine being in school and you're working on something and you're stuck. You're trained to raise your hand and say, teacher, can you help me? And while it feels like the right thing to do because you want to get it right, whatever right actually means, it's a version of quitting honestly, and it slows you down. And while this, you know, mindset of, Hey teacher, I need some help. It works for good grades. It does not work for wealth because wealth loves speed. And when you stop and look for answers and raise your hand and want to get it just right, you are literally stopping your momentum and you've got to pick it right back up. I remember hosting community one time and, um, somebody that I knew really well was not really active. And I was worried about her. I was like, girl, are you okay? Where have you been? Like I was emailing her. I was like, are you okay? And she finally got back to me. She was like, oh my gosh, I've had so much success. My sales are going like crazy. In fact, the CEO of the company that I sell for, he wants to meet with me to ask me what I've been doing because my numbers are off the charts. I haven't been able to come up for air. I've been working so hard. I'm like, oh, that's why she hasn't been so active in the community because she's been active in the world. And you can use asking questions and wanting coaching and wanting advice and wanting perspective, you can use that as a buffer from actually putting your work out there and wanting it to be perfect. And it feels like you're working because you're getting that coaching, you're getting advice and you're making those tweaks. It feels, it feels good. It feels like you're making progress, but the problem is you're not actually producing anything. It feels like you are, but when you put the numbers on the paper, you're really not. And I definitely don't want that for you. And so like this process of when someone says draw a castle, so to speak, or do something differently, if you can feel the resistance and break through the resistance and do it anyway, even if it's wrong, whatever wrong even means, even if it's wrong, even if it's not perfect, if you can push through to the other side, that is a beautiful way to break it through the, the river of misery. And, you know, you can almost think about the river of misery having these buoys while the current is pulling you towards how you've always been. There are buoys that you can grab onto. And I feel like 
if you can you can break through certain resistance points you will hold on to a buoy that's going to get you to the other side now i want to talk about what it can be kind of disguised as like what the current what the current is being disguised as so um if you were to kind of look at the waves and they're and they're rushing you they're streaming towards the um, old identity old identity what that looks like is rationalizations honestly and they're just sneaky little sentences that feel like no big deal little sentences like ah oh, i need to i need to perfect this i'm not quite ready i'm not quite the expert enough Ugh, i'm not so sure if this is if this is right i'm not sure if the timing is right summer's coming up the holidays are coming up i mean i, I honestly what's so crazy for me is like i always would say things like i i think i need a snack first I know it's crazy. It's like whenever anything got hard, I would be like, oh, I just need to get a cup of water. Let me grab a cup of coffee. And honestly, all those rationalizations of like why you don't need to do your work is just a version of resistance. Even things like, oh, but I'm pregnant. Oh, the, but my kids are sick. Oh, I can't do my work today. My husband is out of town. And while they all might be true, they don't matter as much as you think that they do promise you they don't. Um, and I know that, you know, resistance can be beat. I know that resistance can be conquered because of just looking around the world. The fact that I am talking to you through a camera that's going to be put into the world for hopefully hundreds of thousands of millions of people to watch proves that resistance can be broken because someone literally invented YouTube that has changed the world. Lance Armstrong won the tour, tour de France, I don't know how many times, maybe three or four times, with cancer. How many of you would have said, cancer is my rationalization for not moving forward? I'm sure, I know, I know I probably would, but he is proof that you can beat resistance. I just got home from a family vacation when we flew on an airplane. Every time I sit on an airplane, I'm just reminded about how someone broke through resistance to create this new world. Literally a metal tube full of people and suitcases and luggage and engines flies in the air across oceans in the world to take people uh, to new experiences. That is spectacular. Like how many of you would have said, gravity means I can't, this won't work. Gravity is impossible. I would think that a hundred percent bridges were created for huge trucks and lots of cars to go over quickly and efficiently. Like you can break through when you are willing to experience self-doubt and fear. And when you're willing to take action differently and push through even when it's hard. Now, some of you are probably listening to this and you're like, why would I choose the river of misery? When I can stay here, like if I were to describe this person, this $1.5 million Macy, I would describe her as in a warm bed on a Saturday morning with coffee being brought to me in bed and breakfast in bed at that as well. It's like, why would I ever leave this person? And I'll tell you why. Because staying here is its own version of misery. It's a low grade hell, to be honest. I know because I've experienced um, plenty of seasons of my life where I felt like I wasn't moving forward. And I felt like my life was always the same and I wasn't developing and I wasn't growing myself and it is miserable. And I believe God made us that way. Like God made us to create, to produce, for tomorrow to be better than yesterday and for next week to better be better than last week and for next year to be better than last year. And when it's not... It is so painful for me. Like, I feel like there was like a low grade humming of guilt happening all the time when I lived here because I knew that there was more inside of me. I knew that there was greatness. I knew that there was potential that was being untapped and it was nauseating to be honest. I believe everyone has two lives. They got the life that they live and the unlived life. It's this one or this one. So you can either have a little bit of a, live in a pool, as I like to say, a pool of misery where it's got a bunch of 
I don't know if it's mildew, but it's just like moss and fungus and disgusting water or this fresh flowing stream that's the river of misery. While it's painful and hard, it makes you stronger. And at least it's fresh water, right? At least it's refreshing and somewhere that you want to be in. Now, I know you're uh, probably listening to this and you're thinking like, I don't know where to start, right? Like, I don't know what actions to take to really take a step here. And one of the best exercises that you can do is to journal about her, this identity right here, which is for me is $20 million Macy. And one of the most life-changing exercises that I did was journal about her and really ask myself, who is she? Who is $20 million Macy? What does she think about? What problems are she, is, are she solving? How much money does she have? How does she walk? How does she talk to people? What does she eat? And how many friends does she have? What does she do on the weekends? How does she wake up in the morning? What does she do during her free time? Literally sitting there and journaling as much as I could about who she was. And then you take action as her today. And I'll give you a really specific example. When I was journaling about $20 million Macy, it's so crazy how obvious it was that um, I thought about food much differently as her than I do as her. And um, specifically, it was snacking. I had this vision of me having this beautiful Chanel purse. And when I looked in the purse, like I journaled about what was in my purse, okay? What I noticed that was not there was snacks. Like you don't reach into a Chanel purse and hear all this crunk, crunkling up, okay? And um, I typically would always have some sort of bar or pretzels or nuts just kind of in my purse. And I was, I really took it seriously. I was like, hmm, I'm going to not snack. I'm going to take it away. And it's crazy how you take something away and you realize how much of a grip it had, has on you. That's what I did notice for me in snacking. And I found that almost every time I wanted a snack, it only happened when I was sitting down to do my work, to solve a problem, to quote, draw the castle that I've never drawn before. And it was like, instantly I was hungry. <laughs> instantly I wanted a coffee. Instantly I needed a snack and I needed a drink. I needed something to just get up and not have to do my work. And what I found is when I stopped snacking, I was able to do my work so much better with higher quality and so much faster. And of course the byproduct of that was I got healthier. I cut out unnecessary calories. I got to lose my extra baby weight, which was so exciting. But what was so beautiful is the experience of taking action as her and seeing the results pay off as her. And that experience alone is a version of the river of misery because I had to not escape my work, which is what I was doing with snacking. I was trying to find a way to escape the hard stuff, but I actually moved forward to it, ex 